Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you enjoy these live streams, would like to get additional bonus live streams twice a month, you can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. That's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I to sign up. If you would like to get a free digital sketchbook, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you would like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally on Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. I'll forward you to my Amazon author page. You can pick up my books there. So today we are doing some figure drawing again. I have started up my next session of figure drawing classes with Carl Ganas at uh, figuredrawingschool.com. Let me switch over here. And uh, Milk Dud in the foreground, as always. I see we, the comments are already getting lit up. Byron's here. Hey, hey. James is here. Omar is here. Thank you, guys. Good to see you. And you know what? I always wait until like the end of the stream to ask people to hit the, the like button. And if you guys, you know... It, if you guys enjoy the videos, hit that like button now. If there's people you want to share it with, hit that share button now. Let's do it at the start of the show. Spread that word. Omar is here. Hey, everyone. James says, another exciting live stream. I'm excited. I'm excited. Hopefully, you guys are too. Paul's in the chat. Hey, Paul. Good to see you. He says, hello, good people. All right. Let me scoop my dome out of the the camera. So um, the class that I am taking right now is, let me adjust the lighting a little bit, see if I can get this a little bit better. Um, it's a class on heads, hands, and feet. Because uh, something that uh, Carl told me many years ago was that if you get good heads, good hands, and good feet into your drawings, then uh, people will forgive a lot. So what I've got over here are some of the first drawings from the first night of class. And as I always say, the drawings that come out well are, uh, you know, I'm happy that I hit the mark, that I learned a lot from them, um, or that, you know, that they came out, I captured something. The drawings that suck are the most important drawings that you can do because it gives you a chance to learn where your skills need improvement. And a big reminder that I had in, uh, in this particular session is in the same way that I always complain about my proportions with my figures, my facial proportions are off. I'm just not a very good measurer. I'm good at capturing feeling or emotion, a look, a vibe, but actually accurate measurement is something that has always been a weakness of mine. And what I found this morning before starting this stream, I went back and rewatched some of my uh, rewatched the video from this this week's session, and I was trying to draw without any interest or attention to capturing a likeness or capturing the features. I, the things that I'm good at, I ignored, and what I focused on was just purely measuring. And what I found is that when I measure, first off, paying attention to measuring actually made me worse at measuring because I was like trying too hard and I was moving things farther than they should be instead of trying to just focus on getting the hold. But then also just things got really wonky. So now I wanna come back and I'm actually gonna analyze not the drawings from class, but the drawings I was doing this morning. So there's a couple I did that are just, just boo boo ugly. So let's see here. Uh, James says, I'm not sure how common it is for artists to put out sketchbooks, but I have a, a Michael Dooney one. I have Kevin Eastman's Tim and T art book as well. 
Um, well, you know what? I do actually have a sketchbook. Um, Christ. Let me see if I can grab it. It's not a sketchbook. It's an art book. Let me see if I can grab it um, from a table next to me real quick. Let's see here. So this book, this image is one of my most popular art prints. And so it's an image, it's an image called, well, I call the book Wound because it's a girl with a wind-up key in her back, but it's supposed to be a double entendre in the fact that it is a wind-up key, but also she has this wound in her back with the muscles wrapped around it. Um, and honestly, it's something people ask all the time. What's the story about this? Is it a, a comp book? What is it? And there was a time when I was trying to get work as a key art illustrator for movie posters. And that never really went anywhere. But one of the things I started with was just, I thought that this image was kind of very creepy. It would make like a good, I don't know, it would make a good horror film imagery. So it was, it's poster art for a horror movie that does not exist. That said, it's one of my most popular pieces I've ever made. And it continues to be a, um, you know, that's why I made it as the cover for my art book. And inside the book, I've got like a variety of um, just different uh, pieces that I, I've drawn. And also just little bits of text about the artwork. And this is available if you go to my main website, jeremy.net. G E R I M I dot net. Um, you can pick up the piece there. You can pick up the book there. It's still available for sale from my website. Um, or actually, no, it's on my my Amazon store. If you go to Amazon .jeremy net, I mean, you can pick it up at both. But go to the Amazon store. Anyway, um, I've got a little tutorial in the back where I show my thumbnails for working out one of my pieces that was inspired by a convention sketch. And you guys know I love to do like all kinds of thumbnails. So dozens, you know, dozens of thumbnails to work out the pose, the angle, what the character's gonna be doing, then a rough drawing, a cleanup blue line that I print onto uh to Bristol board, and then drawing the, the finished drawing on there before doing the digital color, which the digital color piece I think is. I don't know if it's at the, oh yeah, it is at the end of the book. So I've got the digital color for this piece as well. Um, anyway, if you guys want to check this out, it's not a sketchbook and I probably should start. I've been meaning to put out a book of just my figure drawing work. So that's on my list to do. Um, maybe do it as a Kickstarter. But if you want to see some of my work right now as an art book, this is actually available to purchase on Amazon. It's available also from my store. <laughs> James says, yeah, that's a bit surreal. <laughs> cool. Thank well, hey, that's what I go for with all of my work. Um, anyway, yes, sketchbook, art book. I'm going to have to figure out how to not whack the, uh, the camera whenever I move because it's still wobbling from uh, me bumping into it a second ago. I have sandbags holding it in place, but uh, they're only doing but so much. All right. Um, so this is one of the drawings that I was doing just a little while ago before the start of this stream that really I felt came out poorly. So I'm going to start with this one. And the main thing is just the fact that the model's face was a little bit longer, but I really over-exaggerated how long her face is. And when you're doing comic book work, 
exaggerate. You've got a lot of leeway to exaggerate. And to be honest, you can do figure drawings in an exaggerated style. You know, you can do so that's almost like caricature in uh but doing it in charcoal. So there's not like there's a rule against me exaggerating, but my my personal style is not particularly um caricature art influenced. Um so I'm aiming for something that has a little bit more accurate proportions. As I always say, I'm not a photorealistic artist. I'm not a cartoonist either. I have an illustrative style. At least that's how I sort of define it for myself. Illustrative being obviously, you know, comic books. Um, but I guess more importantly is just trying to capture the essence of something while leaving room to, to add sort of a expressionistic aspect to it. Like when you think of something like a, like a Frank Frazetta, who obviously I, you know, my work does not look like Frazetta's. Um, I wish that it did. <laughs> but Frazetta is somebody who he's respecting the light and volume and anatomy of reality, but he is heightening that work. And I would say that while my work is not Frazetta-like, that level of heightening and distorting reality, ha having something where it's respecting the proportions of reality, but enhancing it, that is what I'm going for. So under those constraints, having a piece that's as where the face is as elongated as this one is, I kind of want to bring the features back into proportion. And something else that I'm trying to, as an experiment, I was going through and just saying, if my goal for this session, not this session, but this semester of classes is to improve my proportion, facial proportions to better than they've ever been before. One of the questions I was asking was like, all right, well, what mental tools can I use to improve my proportions? And one of the things that I'm trying to do and we'll see, I don't know how well I'll be able to display it during this session, but one of the things I really want to do is develop the ability to use not just the features as a measurement tool, like how many eyes wide is the whole face, how many eyes wide is the nose or the mouth, but to use the space in between the features. So looking at between the base of the nose and the top of the lip, for instance, the model, I remember specifically this mouth right here, this line is too high because this is, I'm drawing the line of the mouth and her lip, the top of her lip is up, like, you know, the lips bow upward. So, This line should not be that, or the space there should not be where her mouth line begins, but where the difference is her lip will be here, curve in, and the mouth will be a little bit lower. Oh, now I got my, my fancy snooty camera. I can. Move this down a little bit. Yeah. Look at that. Fancy. I'm all high tech. I was looking at an old uh, video because somebody left a, a comment on it and I just. I was horrified to see how bad the sound was. Like it was super crackly and uh, you know, 
the sound also like it wasn't crisp it was far more echoey than it is with my uh current camera and in fact it might not have even been my uh my laptop it might have been back when i was using my phone to live stream from so actually no i think that if it had been my phone it probably would have been even uh it would have been better better quality so i think it was just i've, I've gone through a, a number of webcams and some of them have had microphones some of them haven't and i think that this particular old video was on applying george bridgman's approach towards figure drawing to animals And I always find it interesting when people comment on older videos. And I'm like, huh, I wonder what it was that brought this up in their stream. You know, but they were complimentary towards it. They just said that it was a very helpful breakdown. So I was just looking at it. And while I was looking at it, I was cringing at how bad the, uh, the audio was. To the point where I'm almost considering breaking out that uh, the books that I was looking at during that stream and redoing the video. Like, as crazy as it sounds to redo a live stream, but to come back to an old live stream and say, I'm going to talk, handle the same topic again. Just seeing how. It comes out with the materials that I have now, the um, the setup that I have now. My drawing ability is hopefully being better. And I see Chris is in the chat. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hello. Hope you're having a good Sunday. So I am going over some drawings from my uh, first session of my figure drawing class that I had earlier this week. Going over my, my, as I always like to say, you know, fixing my bad figure drawings. And it's a challenge because with this model, it's not like she has like an angular or over overly long face. It's just slightly longer than uh, than like an average face. And capturing subtleties where someone doesn't have like a, a cartoonish like Dick Tracy character type face, but just a little bit of a, a subtle difference. Capturing subtle changes versus massive changes. Now, that thing that I had mentioned earlier about you trying to use the space between features as a measurement tool. So one of the things I was thinking about is that, yes, you would use the eyes as a measurement tool to see how wide things are. Now, I remember from looking at the model that first off i think that i probably made these eyes a little bit too big just a little bit cut off this corner and i'll have to come in and adjust the the other eye but secondly that the distance from this eye if you were to go out and double that the hairline or not yeah the hairline coming down the side oh okay at first i thought the eye was too uh that i didn't do the proportions right but i realized now now that i made the eye smaller this actually fits exactly where it's supposed to so the problem and that's that's my point about learning proportions or getting better at proportions is if i get better at them i can end up like i thought that maybe the where the hairline before between the uh that the hair that's between the the ear 
and between the eye, like where the hair comes down in front of the ear. Um, I thought that it was maybe too far over or it wasn't far over enough that I needed it to be like a wider space. But by adjusting the eye to what was, what is the correct size of the eye, I'm like, oh, that was it. That was the problem. The problem was just the eye was too wide. I was prepared to adjust where the hair was. And speaking of adjusting the hair, I realize I'm making, because this is a, a low angle looking up. I'm showing probably too much of the top of the head. Like you're still looking upward at her, but I started putting almost as much hair on top of the head as if you were just looking at somebody at eye level instead of them being tilted backward. You know, and you don't necessarily just have to be studying figure drawings in order to do what I'm doing. Because this whole thing that I keep saying about, you know, redrawing bad drawings and trying to fix them, if you're working on an illustration or a painting or a comp book page, I mean, this is the beauty of doing thumbnails and rough sketches is I, I will go through and I'll do a version of it and I'll be like, ooh, that's that's not working. That That's bad. Doing all of this before you sit down with a clean sheet of Bristol board to draw your final version, your actual comp book page, some people will, will draw on the Bristol and Bristol board is pretty durable and they'll draw and erase and draw and erase and draw and erase and work until they get it right. Um, I believe that you need to do whatever process works best for you, but the process that works best for me is doing all of that stuff in preliminary sketches, doing it in not just thumbnails, but doing layout drawings which really are just working out the proportion and the, the anatomy and then light boxing it or printing it out onto the Bristol board, doing all of that, uh, getting all of the, 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 the difficult stuff worked out beforehand so that when you come to draw your final drawing, all you're really worried about is just rendering. Now for some people, the idea of doing it where all you're doing is rendering in your final piece is boring. They want to be able to do have a challenge, to have stuff to figure out, um, to play with the proportion, to play with the composition when they're working on their final piece. So I would never say, don't do that, that's wrong. I would say, if you're doing it and it's frustrating, then try working it all out beforehand on separate sheets of paper with both thumbnails and layout drawings. Because um, that's what led me to this process. It's not that I think that working it out on the Bristol board is wrong. It's that I found it tedious. I found that like my boards were usually kind of gray by the time I was finished from all the drawing and erasing. I found that... Um, you know, trying to clean up after inking that there was so much, there were so many like pencil marks that were kind of smudged in that I would end up kind of messing up my inks because I had to erase very, very hard to get those drawings out. I mean, to get those, those pencil lines out that would pull up some of the ink. So if it's becoming, if it's a problem for you doing work, trying to do a finished piece, and working out details on the board, then this is an approach that I, I'd say consider checking it out, Tr you know, trying it out, seeing how it works. Um, Paul says, why does tracing a photo, even though it, was, though it is anatomically accurate, look lifeless compared to drawing with your eye? Um, good question. And uh, and by the way, also, I see uh, Monumental Comics is in the chat, says it's looking pretty good. Thank you, Monumental. I appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Paul goes on to say, I did a portrait the other day, both ways. The one I traced was accurate. The other was not. I like the other way better. 
Um, very, very good point. And it's something that I force myself to, you know, to remember, like usually at the start of any semester of classes, the first thing I will write at the top of my um, sheet of paper is feel. And I have to tell myself to remember to actually feel. So I'm not just drawing to, to copy. And like you say, um, you know, just, just rote blind copying to me feels very lifeless. Um, because the act of drawing is, even when you're working from a, a, a live model sitting in front of you, if not just a photograph, photograph is, is harder because the photograph isn't breathing. So it doesn't slightly move and shift. And a lot of times if you're in a life drawing class, that element of the model moving and shifting, some people find it irritating. I find that that, that subtle shift and that life is what makes your drawing feel alive. You're kind of incorporating that into the, the feel of the drawing. But the most important thing is when you're first doing a drawing, you know, when you're first getting that gesture in, when you're block, blocking in the gesture of a figure, if you don't get that gesture, if the gesture is kind of a stiff pose, then the drawing is going to feel stiff. Like it, you've already kind of, in my opinion, you've sort of lost the battle. Everything you're trying to do from then on is you trying to save the drawing if that initial gesture is stiff. And I think that that is sort of, touch it sort of touches on what you were saying, Paul, about, you know, tracing and getting accuracy, but losing that lifelessness. So for me, I think that you can work from photos, but you have to remember when you're working from photos to do the same thing that I talk about when I'm doing gesture or I'm doing, a, you know, doing figure drawing or, you know, whatever it is, is to remember to breathe life into that drawing. And that is very hard to do when you're just trying to get accuracy down. But I think of it as the energy that you bring to a really cool life drawing, a really cool sketch. Like this drawing has better proportions than the drawing right here, even though it's the same model, the same figure, Yes, I did some more rendering, but it's got a little bit more life to it. But this is still stiff compared to what I usually draw. Now, if I were to go in, I'm going to actually do this drawing one more time. And I'm not going to think about measurement and proportion the way that I've been going on and on about. I'm just going to try and draw an energetic drawing. And it'll have what um, you and I were just discussing. It'll have more life than these more studied drawings that have a little bit more accurate proportions. The point of doing all of these studies is you want to meld them both. You want to learn how to capture the energy of a gesture drawing, the, the energy of drawing from a model, you know, in front of you. You want to capture that with the general accuracy of tracing or carefully measuring out proportions. So those are all things that stiffen the work. And what you want is you want to take the things, the accuracy and that, that measurement and combine it with the energy. With, no matter what you're working from, whether you're working from real life, imagination, photograph, model, you know, all of that. You, you want to make it so that you're drawing to the same level of both life and structure, no matter what the source is that you're working from and I also, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Monumental Comics, uh, $5 in the donation in the super chat. Thank you. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, a donation to your future tutorial classes and video series. Hint, hint. Yes, I, uh, well, it, that's kind of what I do on Patreon. The art book study group is actually going through some of the great art teacher books and week by week. We do studies there. So if you want to check that out, Patreon has a thing now where you're allowed to sign up for a week-long trial and then cancel without being charged. So if you want, I would actually recommend going over to Patreon, sign up over there, 
and go directly to Art Book Study Group. There's a whole section of videos just for that and watch some of those and see if those will give you kind of what you're looking for. And, you know, you can just, you know, check out a bunch of videos and cancel after seven days. So it doesn't cost you anything. But that's something that's been an ongoing series I've been doing for a couple of years now where I'm going through art books and studying them in the same way that I study my own figure drawing work. And you can see, you know, see if that is, is, is something that's useful and helpful to you. Um, let me go back up into the comments here. And, uh, and Byron says, because quite often, there's subtleties in a photo that can't be replicated by line alone. Softness and life given by lighting and shadow, for example. Um, that is very, very true. Um, one of the things in figure drawing class, you know, coming from a comic book background, let me move the, the drawing pad over here so I can... fact, I might have to zoom back out a little bit. Let's see here. Zoom back out some. I wish it had a smooth zoom where I could just hold the button. It would slowly go in and then out. Actually, let me, because I've tried multiple times. It didn't do it. But I just want to try one more time and see what happens if I just hold the button. Yeah, it just zooms in once, no matter how long I hold the button. So I was, it, I really like it if it did a smooth zoom, but I'm just happy to have this. Um, but on what Byron was saying, working, coming from a combo background, I'm very much more of a linear drawn eyeball type person. And it took working in figure drawing classes. All right, I guess I should zoom back in. It took drawing, uh, taking figure drawing classes for a number of years to really start to learn to use drawing softly and using tone the same way that you would draw like a shaded ball, but being using tone to draw the underside, the soft part of the, the eyeball, then a hard line for the, the front edge of the eyelid, then a soft but darker tone for the shadow that eyelid casts on the, uh, the eye. Let's go in a little closer. And then when putting in the details of the actual uh, pupil and the iris, you know, these are the kind of things, you know, Byron was talking about that subtle gradient gradient from a dark iris to it getting kind of lighter at the bottom as light is coming in. And then also at the corners of the eyes, the fact that it's like there's a, a ball inside of the ball. So you've got the, the edge of that shadow that the eyelid is casting, but the ball, the eye, you know, the, the eyeball, the cornea, the white part, it's rounding. It's not just flat against the uh, against the surface of the eyelid. And these are little subtleties that it's hard to capture on a model, A, because, you know, models don't stay perfectly still. They're human. They breathe. They subtly shift into pose. But also, unless you are working from a portrait right next to a person, you know, with a person right in front of you, there's a little bit of distance, a little bit farther away. It's hard to see them. So you kind of have to be close up. And then more importantly, like Byron said, it's the amount of time that you need to capture these things. Because you saw that little sketch that I'm kind of obliterating up here that I just drew 
in a couple of seconds, just drawing an eye, whereas to work with tone and value. And the only cast shadow in here really is the this very light cast shadow that's drawn from an eyelid. But, you know, working cast shadow into a drawing, all of these things are things that take time. And I'm not a photorealistic artist. A photorealistic artist would definitely get the glint of light inside of the uh, the pupil here. The um, They would get the, the little area of, there's a little glistening moisture on the uh, the eyelid, the lower lid that you would normally see. These are all little details that you you can capture in a photo. So that's you know when 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 Byron brings up you know the pros of a photo is that yes it captures if you're trying to capture all the detail you can and put all that detail in your work you need the reference. Um, but I would say that then you're looking more at the Norman Rockwell approach of illustrating, where you have multiple photo pieces of photo reference, and then you do painted studies based on that reference, and then you make the final piece. So there's a lot more that goes into that level of detail. Um, I don't know if that level of detail is necessarily meshes well with, say, comic book illustration or doing quick pieces. That's something that's more studied. That's something more like not just Rockwell, but like to go back to Frazetta again. If you're doing, if you're somebody like Frazetta or, um, you know, what's a good example is James Gurney because James Gurney does incredibly detailed lifelike pieces and he does them quickly and he does them with a variety of mediums, you know, do oil, do a lot of watercolor, do a lot of gouache, tons of gouache means working quick. But like if you look at James Gurney's YouTube channel, you'll see that he is somebody who is definitely merging the level of detail that Byron's talking about, those subtleties and details. Um, Paul says, photo's okay. Live model is best. I completely agree on that one. Um, and John, John Ersick in the chat. Good to see you, John. Thanks for, for popping in. Um, John says, people usually kill their line quality when they're tracing. You actually have to learn how to trace. Um, to make tracing work. Also, hi. <laughs> hi, Jeremy. Hi, John. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Um, and I it's funny because I was just thinking in this class that I'm I'm doing where we're just doing heads and hands and feet, that I wanted to sit down and take a bunch of photos and trace over them, but intentionally trace with energy, which I'm gonna when I come back and do this this next drawing, I'll show you what uh what I mean by that. So Byron says, while drawing with your natural hand motions, that gives life even without rendering due to the fact that there's motion. I, I completely agree with that. And and Chris says, two heads are better than one. Looks good. Thank you. Um, I do feel like part of doing, um, like when you do the same pose and you draw it multiple times, I look at it as it's a refinement. Each time I draw it, I'm looking at flaws because this this one is an improvement on this, but this is still flawed. And I may do another drawing. Well, I'm going to do another drawing right now where I'm going to try and just capture life because this to me still feels stiffer than I would like it to. But in the act of doing that, I may lose some proportion. And it's a, it's constantly this back and forth of trying to find a way of, of melding that, that energy and that accuracy, you know, to, to repeat myself. It's all things I'm trying to chase, I guess, kind of a, an artistic unified field theory. <laughs> oh, and thank you. Paul says, man, that's a nice looking eye. Um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, even with this, I feel like in order to draw a really good eye, like when I've watched uh, the instructor, Carl Ganas, that I'm studying with, he can draw an eye this small and he can add all of these incredible subtleties that I haven't captured. And um, for me to do that, I would probably need to draw this at least twice as big. Like this drawing is, you know, I mean, you can see in comparison to my hand, how big it is. So it's not a, a large drawing. It's, uh, you know, it's the size of my thumb. So if anything, it's maybe just around life size. Yeah, it's around life size. 
maybe I'll just say around life size because it could be a little bigger, a little bit smaller. Depends on the, how big the person's eyes are. Um, I have to remember if I can gouge someone's eyes out with my thumb, push it in, then I'm like, oh yeah, I got the size right. This is just about right. So that's what I might have to do: is go out, do some street justice, do some eye gouging, and I can you know, see how close I am. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, and Paul says, now that I have bifocals. It's tough to draw from life because my specs are always messing with me. Getting old sucks. You know, it's weird. I'm at the point now where I like I went from doing the live streams without my glasses to I have to wear them now. I don't have to wear them to see the drawing board, but I have to wear them in order to see the comments on the screen. And I have to wear I have to wear them to see the chat. Like without it, the chat is like. I could read it, but I would have to really strain and like lean forward every single time I'm reading. I read a comment, so I'm right there with you. Um, although, interestingly enough, when I am in, um, when I right now the classes I'm doing are through Zoom, and I find that when I start drawing with the model, it actually helps to take my glasses off so that I I, I can see I I can only see the main features the eye the nose the mouth and you know i don't see like a lot of little folds you know the, the folds in the mouth or you know extra you know ripples in the the eyelid these are all things that if i'm doing a long pose it makes sense to add them but for a quick pose i kind of want to just focus on the the major because the the drawings we're doing in class like you know this first drawing and even this one that's underneath, these are like five minute poses. So that's me like trying to capture as much as I can, like lightning fast, you know. And I know people who can do even more detail in five minutes, but I also know people who in five minutes, all you're going to get is just a bare like shape and position of the head. And even with me, like a lot of times I'll have, I can show you some of the stuff that I did in class. There's other bad drawings I did. Um, let's see here. Paul says, uh, drawing realistic from life totally gives me confidence in my cartoon work. Uh, I'm the same that I, the whole reason why I started taking figure drawing classes was to make better comics. Um, and I found that I, now I love drawing from the live model as an art form unto itself. But originally that was, that was my, my goal. I had the same motivation as you. And then Paul says, so violent, true. There's some folks out there that need some eye gouging. That's, you know, that's just, I'm, I'm going to say that the two can be true at the same time. I will show you guys real quick. Um, you know what? I'm just going to set this down because otherwise it's going to fall. So uh, this is the book on drawing heads that uh, my instructor, Carl Ganas, published. And that's how you, uh, you spell his name, G-N-A-S-S. Anyway, this class is, this book is sort of like, it's the, the manual for his class. And he covers a lot of the, a lot of the concepts he does in the class in this book. So this is one that I actually really recommend. He's got a great he, all the features he he does in detail in terms of breakdowns, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. Like he's got you know a couple of pages on each just in terms of breaking them down. Like even the ears. So you know he gets into the 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 skeleton underneath. The, the anatomy, the, the flesh, the name of, of all the different facial muscles, um, but tons of examples of heads from different angles with an emphasis on structure and volume. So if you guys are interested in that, I recommend this book. Um, he mentioned in class that Amazon is sold out right now. So you would have to look up Stuart Ng, which is uh, stuartngbooks.com. It's a, a great art store or a great bookstore with on art books. 
and uh, you can get it there if that's something you're interested in. So what I was going to say was what we were just talking about. So I'm going to try and draw this one one more time, but with some energy, some, some force behind it. Let me move this up a little bit. I have like a yoga block on my desk that my board is balanced on because to be honest, I really don't like drawing. Like my, my drawing table is angled as opposed to just being flat, it's it's angled. But realistically, I like drawing with something like angled even higher. But if I have it angled as high as I'd like, then the laptop that's on my table will slide down. So I have it at a lower angle, but I will use a, a yoga block to to ri raise up my uh, my board to a level that's that's more comfortable for me. So let's zoom in some. Use my hand as a measurement. All right. So let's see. No, I think I do have to lay that down in order to move this up as much as it needs to be. No, nope. I better keep that there because otherwise I'm going to accidentally press keys on the keyboard. I'm just going to scoot up a little bit more. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, ergonomics, how I actually have myself, my body position, plays a huge role in how well a drawing does or doesn't come out. Huge role. So taking a look at that same drawing, let's see here. Just focusing on energy and making something feel lifelike, I'm still trying to get in these structural arcs Loosely blocking in some proportion. And I already feel like I am drawing in too dark. You know, and this was something that actually I had asked my instructor about in class. And he kind of, you know, just said, you know, it's something that we're going to get into down the road. 
but that's a, an interesting challenge is the fact that the features, her actual physical features of the model, her eyebrows angle down sharply. They angle down like almost as if like kind of a Wolverine type, like giving you those furrowed brows, but that's the shape and the direction that her angles, that her eyebrows traveled. Her expression itself, her demeanor was very calm, peaceful, um, and very pleasant person. It's not like she had like an, an unpleasant or an angry face. And that was one of the interesting things I asked him was like, how do you, how do you thread that needle? Or how do you capture, if you draw what the, the anatomy is doing, it makes it feel like something different than what's actually going on there. And I also need to figure out how I want to have the board angled because I'm looking at this right now. Oh, okay. I guess I do need to angle this upwards right now. Cause I realize you guys are looking at this from this angle, which is distorted. This to me is upright and comfortable the way I like drawing, but it makes the face, I'm looking at the camera now and I'm like, wow, that looks really badly distorted. So I need to angle my board so that my camera is, is set up so that the, it's, the camera is pointing down towards my drawing board. It's facing the drawing board, but it's not, what it is is my drawing board is at an angle. My drawing table is at an angle. And so the camera is at an angle. So the camera is not facing straight down. It's facing this way, sort of parallel to the table. But since I have my board not parallel to the table, you were getting a distorted view of this, if that makes any sense. And I think about that because I'm like, well, what's the point in, in doing drawings in front of you guys if you're just going to see the distorted angle as opposed to seeing an actual, you know, an angle that kind of accurately portrays what I'm seeing. But that does make it kind of tricky for me because now I'm drawing at a sort of a weird angle. And so now on this pass, it's not that much different, but I'm just trying to think No, actually, I'm not trying to think. I'm trying to feel. I'm trying to sit here and say, all right, what feels right on this? How, you know, where does the head turn? Where do the eyebrows come in? And these drawings are not particularly large drawings. Like if you look at this, this drawing, yeah, I have big hands, but this drawing is, you know, it's the size of my palm, her head, her actual skull, not even the whole hand, her head is like the size of my palm. If I wanted to do an actual detailed drawing, then I would need to draw at least twice as large to do something that's really detailed. And James makes a great point, an excellent point. Um, well, James, I thought he was saying that, uh, well, James says, sometimes my lines are too light. He says, construction lines should be light, though. That is very true. I mean, to be honest, most of the time, the construction lines should be so light that you probably couldn't even see them on camera. Um, and I'm not drawing these darker so that for you guys' benefit. Yeah, he's, uh, James says, construction lines should be light, though I, I have to be sure they aren't too dark. Um, construction lines, I'm not drawing these darker for your benefit. I'm drawing them because I'm a, bit, a little bit too heavy-handed. And the faster I draw, the darker I tend to make lines because I'm going to make fewer of them. I'm trying to kind of get more to the point. So it's almost like doing an ink drawing. You know, and one of the things I found was that 
for the longest time, I did not like charcoal pencil. And I used to, when I would do a uh, figure drawing class, I would use graphite pencil. I was still using a 4B, so something that was darker. But I was doing a 4B graphite, so a 4B charcoal. Because every time I started drawing with charcoal, it would be like working with ink, but smeary. Like it was like drawing with mud, really. But I think that charcoal pencil does a really good job of laying down values and blocking out value and and soft turns. It allows you to work edges in a way that pencil feels very labored. This is a little bit more of a direct way to work edges if you were doing a preparatory drawing for an actual painting later on. Because in painting, edge control is very, very important. And I think that charcoal pencil does a very good job of simulating the types of edges you're going to be working to control. Now, on the thing about construction lines, there's two things, which is one, you can always come in and sort of lightly go over them afterwards. But I'll show you another real quick thing. When I do, I'm going to do one more drawing after this, and then we're going to call it because it's already almost an hour. The time flies when I'm hanging out with you guys um, in a good way, but it goes very quickly. Um, but with charcoal pencil, and actually even with graphite, um, you can loosely block in a drawing and then erase and it almost becomes kind of like a ghostly image for you to just sort of work over and kind of repaint your details back in and sometimes when i'm working with charcoal I'll, what i did just there is i just ran some lines over there the point of that is to get myself back to being able to do light soft tones because twice i tried to put a shadow on the side of the nose and it was giving me a line instead of a tone and i don't know why it does that but sometimes you just have to kind of get your pencil back into tone mode almost like when you're working procreate and it's giving you lines and you want to have something that's a soft side of the pencil in fact it's ex almost it is exactly the same thing and i don't know why Maybe Procreate is just really good, that good at uh, imitating traditional media that it makes you do stuff that you have to do with traditional media. But one of those things is having to come in and, and get those sides of the form, get a tone going on there. This is getting too dark here. In fact, if you guys don't mind me going a little bit over, I kind of want to do an experiment with you guys, or at least show you what I'm thinking. Because I want to show you what happens if I take a drawing and do construction lines too dark, and then just smear them so that I have room to work into it. And then I want to see what happens if I take a drawing to the level of finish that I just did with this one, which I mean, what? I spent maybe 10 minutes on this, less than that, you know, eight, maybe 10 minutes. I didn't spend too long on this. Um, but I wanna show you what happens if I take a drawing like this and smear it out and then come back in and draw on top of that. Because that's something, James, for you, like that might be interesting to consider is taking a drawing, if you're working in graphite or charcoal or anything like that, and being able to obliterate parts of the drawing, which, you know, kind of like when you see somebody draw something that you're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And then they just take an eraser to it. And you're like, what are you doing that was perfect 
but they're doing it to try and get to something beyond perfection. I'm sorry I slid this whole lower half underneath off the screen. Let me see if I can find something to set. You know what? I'm just going to have to zoom out a little bit. And now I've lost the remote. Oh, there's the remote. <laughs> Still getting used to this. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, so Chris asks, is that a charcoal pencil you're using? What kind? Yes. Yes, it is a charcoal pencil. I am using a General's 4B Soft. So it's a General's charcoal pencil. And I am using mine. I also have, I've got dozens of these at this point all around my house. So these are lead holders. And it allows you to use a pencil down to the nub. These things to me, worth their weight in gold. And the nice thing about this is that it has two different heads for two different sizes. One size is for larger, you know, thicker pencils. And the other side is for like, you can put, um, you know, like a, like a regular number two pencil, or this is a, a Prismacolor color pencil. Why is, uh, there we go. I don't know what it is. Something with the, the lighting. It's not letting you see the, the words on it, but trust me, it's a Prismacolor blue pencil. Oh, there we go. Anyway, um, one side can hold extra thick pencils if you've got like different types of charcoal pencils. The other side can hold uh, just normal, regular graphite size pencils. So you just put this guy back in here and it lets me keep erasing all the way. I mean, not erasing, but keep sharpening all the way down to the nub. Like this guy's getting close to the end of his life, but you would would definitely you would not be trying to draw with this i would hope that no one would be sitting here trying to draw with a little nub like this um yeah love these pencil extenders i buy them in bulk um let's see here and paul says uh looks like brie larson i could see that She's got curly hair, whereas I think I've mostly seen Breen Larson with straight hair. But uh, let's see here. And Paul says, time flies for sure. He said, this dream has been great for my Sunday afternoons. You know what? I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, I, part of me doing it is like me doing studies and doing work that I'd be doing anyway. But knowing that other people are enjoying both the, the hanging out and I guess having company and having people to talk or shop and talk art with at the same time, it's like we got our own little little art community here, which I dig that. Um, let's see here. James says, I have that Prisma one. Um, and he says, yeah, the blue pencil. He said the blue pencil would be graphite. Let's see here. And Chris says, I've got General 6B Extra Soft. I could use those pencil extenders. Um, they have the most art stores. You can also get them on uh, Jerry's Artorama. And, uh, and at, at Dick Blick, I mean, you can get them on Amazon too, but if you're going to order art supplies from an art supply place, I recommend either Dick Blick or Jerry's Artorama. Let's see here. And James says, I should get a new one soon, the, the pencil. <laughs> Thanks, Byron. Byron says, Jeremy's streams are always a good time. I, I appreciate that. Good time for me too. Um, Chris mentions that... Uh, you know, he finds them too soft. The 6B is hard to get a, a consistent sharpened point on them. Um, well, I mean, I sharpen mine. I don't know if you've ever done the whole thing where you sharpen it with a razor blade as opposed to sharpening with a pencil sharpener. So I use like a razor blade and I shave off a fair, like a fair amount of the wood 
and then I'll sand it down with sandpaper. And the thing about it is, like you said, they're soft. They break really easily. So the way that I tend to sand mine is instead of just rubbing it back and forth, what I do is I lay it down against it and I just rub like this. And I rotate it as I'm sharpening that way. So I'm putting less force on it and it takes a little bit longer to get it sharpened, but it gives me kind of a nice shape. And actually, again, Carl Ganas, if you go to, um, he has a YouTube page. He has a YouTube page. If you go type his name into YouTube, he has a video on how to sharpen a pencil. I know it sounds stupid. Watch the video. Because even now, I still, like my pencil, there's a specific shape that allows you to get a really nice transition between tones and lines. And I kind of get it after like 15 years of figure drawing classes. But he has like a thing where he does it perfectly without even trying. And it's fantastic. But also that video is part one of a four-part series. It's actually about working with... It, it, it basically in four videos he breaks down his entire figure drawing process of getting down gesture building structure and then using tone for anatomy so it's a four-part series and he starts with the sharpening of the pencil because you need the tone to do all of the stuff that he does after so he starts with this is how you this is the tool you need in order to do what i'm going to about to teach you and then he teaches you his whole figure drawing process in three videos three like 10 minute videos. Like I've taken classes with him for years because I love being in the class with him and having him correct my work and other students work and hearing his thoughts, his philosophy and his ideas about different approaches to drawing. But literally everything he teaches is in three videos on his YouTube channel for free. Like everything else he teaches is built on that and there's tons to learn from his actual classes. But I, I highly recommend checking that out. Um, <laughs> Paul mentions I've been drawing uh, with shorten up my my whole life. <laughs> Side eye, you nasty, Paul. Paul, you nasty. Um, Chris mentions that he he uses a scalpel. He says I'll try it your way, sharpened with sand. He says um, I use a scalpel. I'll try your way, uh, sharpen it with sandpaper. I haven't tried uh, tried your um, your way. I, I will mention two things that help. And Carl mentions both of these in the video, but they, they're bare repeating because there's they're subtle di difficulties or there's subtle differences that will make it easy. You don't want to cut away at the pencil. What you do is you hold the blade straight. Then you put your thumb on the back of the blade. The blade stays straight. And what you do is you lay the pencil against it and pull. And you pull and you rotate the pencil and pull. That will give you a very, it'll give you way more control over how much of the wood you're taking off at once. Whereas if you just go at it, whether you're using a scalpel or a utility knife or an X-Acto blade, if you just hold the pencil and going at it, you're not gonna have as much control. You're gonna cut out too much in some places, not enough in others that gives you a lot of control. The second thing is, I'm sure people, if you've done figure drawing classes, you've seen those little pads of sandpaper that they give you. That Those pads of sandpaper are like 200 grit and or like even 300 grit. They're very fine and they only take off a little bit of wood and charcoal at a time. You want to get like I don't know if you can see on the back of this. It says 80 there. This is 80 grit sandpaper. And I just cut up those sheets of sandpaper you get at the hardware store into uh, squares that are the size that fits into my, my drawing kit. Use rough sandpaper as opposed to really, really smooth. Like I like 80, but 100 is probably the most you want. If you go to like start getting to 120, you're going to end up where it's like taking a while to sand it. And then it's hard to shake out the, the, the sandpaper. Like... This one thing of sandpaper, well, it could last me a year if I want. I try to remind myself to change it like every semester to throw out one square and use a new one. But you could use the same piece of sandpaper for like a year because the, the grid is so thick 
it is so large that you just shake it out on your paper when you're done and you just keep going. It's fine. All right. Um, yeah, we're past an hour. So let me do two quick things. First off, let's zoom back out a little bit. And I'm going to find another drawing to work from. So I did a lot of crappy drawings. Let's see. Well, let's take a look at some of the stuff that I actually did in class. So I should probably put my pencils down so I don't drop them. Dude, I hate dropping charcoal pencils with a passion because the, the sound of a charcoal pencil hitting the floor is to me, it's like nails on a chalkboard because you know that it is immediately broken inside in like 10 different places. And if you go and you try to sharpen it, you're going to sharpen it a little bit and it's going to snap. You sharpen it a little bit more, it's going to snap. Third time you sharpen it a little bit more, you get it sharp enough to actually use. You're like, oh, finally. And then you start drawing with it. You're drawing with it. And then like two minutes into a pose, snap, it breaks again. And I've gotten to the point where if I drop a charcoal pencil, I just throw it away. I, I'm like, I don't even want to bother. It, it's ruined. Um, and if you've ever done a figure drawing class where you're using those tools, you will... Uh, you will know. <laughs> wow, it's so true. It's like the artist and the tool. <laughs> Paul says, broken inside, the worst. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, so going back to the actual drawings I did during the session, let me move my board here. And is this out as zoomed out as far as it goes? Yeah. All right, so that's as far as it goes. I kind of have to move this around a little bit so you can see. Um, everything the model did that night were like five-minute poses. So these are all quick five minutes. And, and like I said, at the start, all I really had a chance to do was like lock in just the basic head and maybe start placing the features. And the next one got more basic head and some of the features. It took like a few poses of the model before I was actually able to finish a whole head in five minutes. Um, it takes a little while to warm up. And then we got in here and I got a couple, like this one, the proportions are wonky. This is when I was trying to get, to capture her long, the face that was a little bit longer. And this is another one. I think this is what I'm gonna draw next because this one looks very wonky in comparison. But you know, this one, this one felt like I was starting to get the proportions a little, you know, a little bit close to what they should be. And then I you know, going back, this is another one where the features were well placed. And what is here, I think is a good drawing, but I focused on the features and didn't have a chance to, I didn't even have a chance to finish her hair, didn't have a chance to finish both eyes. Um, the eye and mouth and nose that I did get, it's like I was focusing on getting the proportions correct and getting this angle of the head tilted down she's kind of giving you this marlena dietrich like noir film actress look and trying to get that pose of her her head kind of tilted down and her looking up at you all most of my time the time that we go into drawing hair and getting all the features right went into getting the angle of the head right so that's why you know this is sort of the the construction on here was the main feature and then uh there's another one, different pose. I mean, they're all headshots, so it's not like any of the poses are super radical or different or crazy. Ugh. Again, some different views, kind of a low angle view. Another, you know, gave us quite a few angles that were from below. This one, the head, the all of the proportions are off. Like the head doesn't feel like it's got enough back to the skull. The features feel they're off. Yeah. This one, the eyes are too big. Um, and that's a problem I think a lot of artists have because, you know, the eyes, quote unquote, being the window to the soul, we focus on them. And I think not even in trying to do like anime eyes or doing like the, the big eyed girls, you know, that it's not like I'm trying to do that style or that look, it's just in focusing on something that we as humans focus so much on, 
I tend to make them out of proportion in large. And this was me. This was the one. I, I made a note here that I drew this one with my glasses off, and I actually was happy with it. Now, like I said, her her eye, her brows being arched like that are because that's just the shape that her eyebrows follow on her skull. She didn't. She wasn't making an angry face, and that's something that I was, you know, kind of battling with. And I think. Let's see. Is this the the last? Yeah, I think that this is sort of the uh, the end of class was just, you know, this one, which oddly enough, I don't know if it's the eyes, but she kind of reminds me of Anna Joy Taylor. And then there's another one where I really just did not get any of the details in, didn't get the proportion right, um, the structure is wonky. And that's, that's the whole point of it. It's not like figure drawing classes for making masterpieces. Figure drawing class is the lab to go in and experiment and learn. Let's see here. Oh, I started writing the word Chase PR. And I'm like, what's PR? It's because I never finished writing here, Chase Proportion. You can't see what I'm doing. I'm writing it off screen, but... uh. My figure drawing classes, my work from figure drawing class is filled with notes to from the instructor taking notes from their lecture, as well as notes that I'm doing um, of ju just, just notes to myself, observations I make about my process, things I want to experiment with and try, um, you know. All right, uh, let's see here. So James says uh teachers in school didn't like it when i banged a pencil against the desk well you know what it is is teachers are so busy trying to maintain control of a a school environment a classroom environment that a lot of times they view any any student making noise you just if you're just tapping out a beat or just having whatever they view it as a student trying to take control from them trying to wrest control of the classroom and from what i've seen i've never been a full-time teacher i have worked i've taught animation in middle school i did it for one year and i was not asked back so because i i don't know if i have the temperament for working with middle schoolers there's a certain age of like just leaving the cute phase and just it's like honestly high schoolers are usually pretty cool little kids elementary school kids pretty cool Middle school is when they're just little shits who love to torment anyone around them. And that's just the age where I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not suited for this. And we were, we were working with middle schoolers. Um, point being is that I, from what I've observed of teachers, maintaining control of the classroom is paramount. Maybe it's part of us just watching Abbott Elementary. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's a constant battle. So I can see why a teacher would just give you shit just for banging um, bang a pencil against the desk. Doesn't make it all right. Doesn't make it all right for them to yell at you or be mad, but uh, I'm just saying that's there's a method to their madness. All right. Uh, 93 RP1. By the way, I don't think I've seen you before in the live streams. I hope, uh, I ho thank you for watching. Um, I hope that you subscribe because I do these live streams weekly, usually not every Sunday, but most Sundays throughout the year. Every once in a while, I'll give people a heads up. I've got a convention or some other family stuff. I'm not able to do them, but you know, most Sundays. So hopefully you'll be able to make it for the next one. Subscribe to the channel. And if you're not able to make it, if you're subscribed, the replay should show up in your feed in terms of stuff you subscribe. So, you know, you can always catch the replays because these are always, I leave them up for people to watch whenever after, uh, after I've done them. But 93 RP one says, uh, these walkthroughs are great, Jeremy. Thanks for showing us and walking us through your class experience with us. Helpful. I've never had a life drawing class. Um, and Jason also says, uh, very helpful and informative. Thanks. Well, for both of you, I will tell you that what makes a lot of people not take figure drawing classes is the same thing that stops most people. Fear of being embarrassed. Fear of doing bad work in public in front of people. And I'm here to tell you let go of that fear. 
because everyone in figure drawing class is trying to get better and it's a very supportive environment it's not a place where people are critiquing and snickering if somebody does a bad job um in fact i've learned from over the years doing classes in person i've learned just as much from my fellow students as i have from my instructors i mean and st students that are like fresh out of school and like a decade younger than me um you can learn from anybody and being in a room full of people that are all kind of it's almost like we're all unified in the the spiritual act of trying to create to, to improve our craft and improve our ability to create um i mean i will tell you that when i was in college i took figure drawing classes and i did not like them even though i was probably one of the better draftsmen in the class it wasn't a it wasn't a uh, an art center or an illustration school it was a fine art school where people were more there's a lot more conceptual art going on than anything like video and new media and installations so the fact that i could draw it was like okay i was one of the better drawers but you know no one really cared and, and if anything the program actually probably made me a worse artist because i wasn't focusing on my draftsmanship as much as i should be point being is that I had never worked from live models before. When I started doing it, I was very bad at it. Most people don't like doing things that they're bad at. So I, for years, I avoided it. And I was like, I like drawing from imagination. Because when I draw from imagination, things come out the way that I, I want them to. I could sit down and with a lot of hard work, make something look like what the picture in my head was. But drawing just observation, I was always horrible at it. At a certain point, decades after I got out of art school, I realized my fundamentals just weren't as strong as I wanted them to be. And a bunch of people, that my coworkers, started taking figure drawing classes. So we all just were doing it together. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head. And I'm like, oh, this is where you learn the fundamentals. And until I sit here and go through it, I'm always going to be bad at it. So to a certain degree, doing life drawing if you haven't done it before like like uh 93 rp1 said you, you know you've never had a life drawing class it takes a certain level of humility to be willing to do something and know you're going to suck at it it takes humility and it's not easy to do that like mentally but once you let go of trying to make good work and just say i'm here to learn and the point of every drawing I do is learning, not making good drawings. Because like I showed you, and there are drawings in this that I did in class, I would say are good drawings. There's also drawings that are bad drawings. Um, then there's drawings like, this is the start of a good drawing, but what I did in class isn't finished. I wasn't didn't have time to finish it. Um, you'll have all sorts of range, but the result is not what's important. What's important is the learning process. And if you can let go of that fear and say, it's okay to make bad drawings. Like I even say, that's why I call these sessions I do, I call them fixing bad figure drawings. I want people to feel it is okay to do bad drawings. You get better by doing bad drawings, but it's not pencil mileage. It's not just getting all the bad drawings out of your system. It's doing the bad drawing, looking at them, analyzing them, figuring out what's not working and then putting it back into the, uh, the iteration loop, taking some, like, you know, I literally, I sat and I drew this drawing, you know, twice, you know, I, I drew it once right before starting this session. I drew, drew it again during the session and I could probably draw it two or three more times and learn something from each version of drawing it. And if you approach a life drawing class with the idea that, doing the bad work is a tool for learning as opposed to something you're going to be judged on. It will free you up. It will help you grow much faster. And more importantly, you'll actually enjoy doing it. Even if the drawings suck, because on my worst night of doing figure drawing, I still have a great time. I just love the process and the learning. In fact, I mean, honestly, I feel like my art to some degree suffers from the fact that I enjoy the act of making it more than caring about the result but that's how much i love the act of making it um let's see here 
And Chris mentions, I've been taking uh, classes for a year now with Richard Smitherian, or S Smitherman, sorry, Richard Smitherman. I'm going to write that down on my, uh, my notes here. Richard Smitherman. And uh, he says he's a master with the figure. Well, I always love discovering new masters. So thank you so much for, for sharing that, Chris. I will definitely check him out right after the stream. Um, let's see here. 93RP1 says, I have subscribed. Thank you so much for your thoughtful responses. You're right. Everyone's learning expense experiences are valuable, invaluable. I love listening to them all. Uh, well, that is great. I'm, I'm happy to hear it. Um, so I went on talking so much that, you know, we've gone for almost a, a half hour longer. So I think what I want to do here is what I, the, the experiment that I was going to try, I'm going to do it quickly. So I'm going to try and do it in no more than 10 minutes per drawing, maybe five minutes if I can. So it's going to be rough and it may not express what I'm trying to get after here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one drawing where I'm going to, oh, well, you know what? I'm just gonna end up destroying this drawing. That so I'm gonna I'll show you first. I'm gonna do a drawing from another angle where I'm gonna do this. Is goes back to when um, when we were talking with James and I mentioned construction lines being too heavy. So let's say I come in here and I do. I'm drawing uh, this this drawing up here, which I was not happy with the. Um, the result of just so you know what I'm I'm drawing. I'm gonna come up here and just go in roughly and by the way just using the side of your pencil for all of your 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 construction lines as opposed to using the tip that alone gives you softer lighter construction lines so that's another a little pro tip for you there. So all I've done here is block in where the ear is, the brow line, and then parallel with the bottom of the ear is the base of the nose. So I, let's say I just put in a nose right there, the, the corner of the far eye, and then I just drop in the eye socket and let's say the muzzle and the mouth, just the line for the mouth. And that mouth is higher than I want it for this, this model. And then again, the, the head on this piece is probably, the back of the head needs to be a little fuller. So I haven't even gone in and, uh, and drawn her hair in yet. I'm going to fix the neck because the neck is all messed up the next should be more like this so i've got this rough drawing sketched in now you could take an eraser and slightly lighten it um kneaded erasers which are they look like little pieces of putty kneaded erasers are good for just sort of like you know kind of lifting it off but another thing you can do is just take um you know, my figure drawing instructor recommends using a chamois, um, like those car wash, like a soft chamois. So kind of like those car wash rags, but a soft one. I honestly like using a tissue, but you can just come in and instead of erasing, you can just push down on this and just smear it, and smear the hell out of it. And when you smear the hell out of it, you can now you can see it's still here but it is we'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see it now but it's kind of ghosted um and it also adds a certain tone to the whole area around it kind of like is if you were um, drawing on toned paper. 
And then what you can do is based on that, you can still see detail in there. So this might be something, I don't know how well it works with graphite. It works fantastic with charcoal. But uh, for James, I know you said you were working with graphite. It's worth giving it a try. Um, I acknowledge that with graphite, your results might be a little bit different. They might be a little bit wonky. You might try and be like, Jeremy's on crack. This don't work at all. Um, but you know what? Life's an experiment. You got to try everything. So I'm not going to come in here and super finish this drawing, but I'm just going to come in here and point being is that now I can come in here and put more refined lines in here and the construction lines, well, hell, the construction lines are just blurred now. So it gives you a chance to, to work details back into the drawing. And the construction lines, for the most part, people won't even notice the construction lines because the construction lines have all been turned to tone now. So that's a handy little trick for you. And I can tell you that I totally turned this drawing. The drawing that I was originally working from was less of a three quarter. And I really turned this to a three quarter pose subconsciously. And that's not a bad thing. If I were just drawing in class and I ended up changing the angle, it's like, all right, not a big deal. The reason why I bring up that I changed it is because along with wanting to improve my, my own personal sense of proportion, I want to improve my ability to accurately capture the direction a figure is facing. So while this is a, a much, I would say this is a, a distinct improvement on the, the drawing that I was, uh, referencing and I'll put them not side by side, but I'll go back at the end here real quick and show you that drawing again. And to me, you, you can see the construction lines much clearer in that drawing that I'm referencing than you can here. Here, the construction lines, they're very faint, but they almost just seem like they are just tones to help express what's happening with the figure. And I'm just putting in some light half tones as the edges of these forms turn away. So that wasn't very long. That was maybe like five or six minutes. So a little bit longer than what I would have in class to do this. And this is me redrawing. This is a redrawing of this one. 
So, like I said, in comparison, you can see the construction lines in here, which, again, I drew them with tone, but I didn't blur, I didn't wipe them down beforehand. Or, or I didn't wipe them down at any point. I just left the construction lines in there because I'm just racing to get it all done. But, you know, James, you mentioned before, you know, sometimes stuff being too light or too dark with construction lines. This is for anybody because I tend to make construction lines too dark. Um, you can draw with construction lines and then smear them down to kind of cut them out. Or you can erase them. If you're going to ink something, if you're doing more comic book work, you're going to ink it. In that case, I would not recommend the, uh, the smearing that's when I would recommend the, the putty eraser to just lift off some of the graphite and lighten it. But if you were doing something where it's a charcoal drawing or it's just drawing for, for practice or just drawing that's a little bit more expressive and painterly and it doesn't matter, um, then I actually think you can get a lot of really pleasant tone out of something like this where you, uh, where you just smear it. So... In fact, I'm going to come in and take this drawing that I did, and I'm going to smear this one down so you can see what happens if you take a drawing to that level of finish. Actually, you know what? Here. You saw what I did with this. You saw me smear it down the first time. I actually like this drawing. I like this drawing better than that drawing. I was going to – I want to give myself some options. Because believe it or not, I'm thinking about the thumbnail on YouTube for the video. So I'm going to take a picture of it real quick of both of these to use for the thumbnail. And the reason why I took the picture is because now I'm going to take this drawing and I'm just going to, it's not going to completely obliterate it. Um, but you can come into any drawing. This is where working with charcoal painting, with charcoal pencil, it imitates working with, um, it imitates working with oil paint. Because with oil paint, you can scrape off some of the oil, or if you do a session and you don't like how things are come out, you can paint over them. I'm not paint over them, but you can wipe off the actual oil and you just wipe off the day's work. And you're like, that didn't work. I'm going to wipe it off and I'm going to try again. Um, charcoal pencil very much imitates that process. And I think that's why a lot of, I think that's why it's more of a, a painter's study tool because it imitates the, the process the find the old masters did of like both of being trained with pencil and ch with charcoal learning to refine a drawing learning how to the sculpture the whole thing of being able to wipe something down and then rebuild on top of it it's like it prepares them for going to work with oil paints um that said i'm more of an acrylic painter but i've never really worked with oils uh so i love people swear by oils i'm not giving the oils any shade I just like to work fast and oils require more patience than I have. Yeah, James says, I usually erase them when I'm going for a more complete drawing. Yeah, if you're working on graphite, if you're going to ink something, then erasing versus wiping down is definitely better. So you can see a lot of tone in here. Now that I've, I've wiped this down, you can still see a lot of the drawing. Now you can come in here with an eraser on top of that and you can just use this like you're just this is almost like you're using white white chalk now there's this whole field of uh of tone and value and this is the reason why i love sticky erasers because you're really, I mean, you can draw with a kneaded eraser, just kind of mush it into a wedge shape. You can shape it however you want. 
Um, but I very much love the the feeling of using a, an eraser as a drawing tool. So at this point, I'm just sort of moving around the, uh, the light shapes. And I had never really done the process of erasing and drawing into like a field of tone. This is something um, I actually learned um, great concept artist and teacher, uh, Ron Velasquez, Ron, Ron Velasco. Sorry. Sorry, Ron. Ron Velasco. Um, he's done concept art for you know, a lot of major animation studios. And I met him at the Animation Guild taking classes with uh, with Carl Ganas. And he actually substitute T taught for, um, for a semester when Carl was gonna be traveling and teaching. And I remember like during his, during his class, he showed me this technique and this process. Um, and he said, yeah, just give it a try. And I will tell you like, I fell in love like at the jump with this process because um, I've worked on toned paper before and I still never really feel like I, I get my values right working with white chalk on the toned paper. But this method just, it spoke to me. It really, really spoke to me and I don't know why but it totally felt exactly like what I needed. So I am internally, eternally grateful to Ron for that. And that's another reason why, I mean, I've been studying with Carl for years. I enjoy studying with him. I recommend people take his classes. That said, it is very, very good to study with a wide variety of instructors. If you're somebody who is on the path of taking art classes, um, I don't think it's healthy to just study one technique or one process. I know some people that are like Riley method all the way. Some people are Bridgman method all the way. Um, some people are, are Loomis all the way. Um, I think that it is really the, the best way to grow is to try a little bit of, of everyone's process. And even if you don't end up liking a process that a particular instructor has, or it doesn't work for you, I think that you will learn from, from experimenting with a different person's process, a different teacher's process, different teacher's approach. Okay. So we're getting pretty long here at this point. It's already, you know, hour 45. So all I'm going to do is just add a little bit of hard line, some black to the underside of the nose the mouth and one of the eyes and then we're going to wrap this up but this is just to show you so the difference between blurring out or wiping down your um your construction lines versus what happens if you say all right i'm going to go balls out and i'm going to wipe down the entire drawing So I hope you guys will forgive me for going long today, but I thought it was a an interesting thing that I've never really shared before.
And when I say shared, it's not that it's my process. It's things that I've picked up from instructors over the years that I think it's worth trying. And, you know, like uh, like some of you guys mentioned before, not necessarily having a figure drawing class experience. These are things that you might not learn. You, you might not know from uh, or you, you would learn from maybe other students, you know see somebody else doing a technique and be like, oh, hey, how do you do that? And what is the, the tool that you're using to, to do that with? All these little things that you uh, you pick up that maybe they'll fit into your artist, artistic toolbox. Maybe they won't. Um, but you won't know until you, you'll never know if somebody doesn't show you. Because I think only a tiny amount of my actual artistic ability has come from just sitting by myself and experimenting. A lot of it has been from having people give me ideas, give me approaches, give me techniques, and then say, hey, go home, try this, see how it works for you. Yeah. I mean, I'm constantly making notes to myself about different ways to to look at anatomy, proportion, um, gesture, constantly asking myself, well, what happens if I approach it this way? What happens if I approach it conceptually that way? What if I, you know, work with more tone and less line? Like one of the things I have to remind myself all the time is to try and, and I'll tell you the drawings I did during class really don't convey it because uh, I didn't do it. But the idea of saying, all right, I'm going to try and do as much of the drawing with the side of the pencil and working in tone like a painter as possible. And then only at the end do I use line. And all these things are approaches. They're not rules. They're approaches. Let's see here. <laughs> I see Amar on there. And he's like, I'm surprised you're still on. Shit, I'm surprised too, man. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the hell out of here. This is the last bit. I'm going to finish this drawing and I'm out. <laughs> He said, uh, "You're putting in time for this um, for the uh, today for this stream." And he said, "Uh oh, wipe it down." And he's like, "I was um, I was most of the time the one bumping my head up against the the wall inside of my own box." Uh, well, you know, I mean, hey, yeah, we we all go through that um, because generally speaking, art making is such a solitary act. And I think that's one of the re another reason why I love figure drawing so much is because it really did change the process where I didn't feel alone in my struggles. And it made it actually feel okay to be struggling because I would look around and I would see other people who I thought did very fine work in class. And I would see them beating themselves up and just be like, oh my God, this sucks, and I want to give up. Or just watching people who were who are really good artists, but watching them get frustrated, like really frustrated with themselves. And I'm like, it it ain't that serious, you know? And I'm like, first, and you're doing good work anyway. Um, I know I should be that gentle with myself. Um, I'm not, but I figure maybe by encouraging others to be that gentle with themselves, maybe I can encourage it for my to for me to treat myself that way. When I tell you guys to 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 be cool and it's not serious and just enjoy the process, that's me trying. I'm just sharing with you my self talk so that I stop yelling at myself about how much I suck and and being angry and upset about all that. Um, So, yeah, I, again, things that are helpful to me that I hope help you. 
but yeah, Amar, you're you're right. I've been been on for a hot minute. I am putting a couple more lines into this, and then I'm calling it. And for anybody who is still on or anybody who joined late, um, hit that like button. If you know anybody who, who enjoys watching people draw, hit that share button and pass it on. All that helps me grow the channel. I want to get that YouTube plaque hanging on my wall behind me. But I can't do that. You guys got to make that happen. All I can do is show up every week and keep drawing. Now I just sound like I'm pandering. It's, I feel sad now. <laughs> all right. All right. I've done enough with this. Now I'm trying to tell myself, stop, stop. It's far enough. You don't need to do anything else. You know, I think I am so pleased with how the, the wipe down method worked. I think I'm really going to start working the same when I'm doing like 10 or 15 minute poses in class, because I feel like what I had before, before wiping this down and then going in and drawing on top of the previous drawing, like to me, this really is, uh, it feels to me like it's a distinct improvement over what I had just minutes before. And you know me, I love to improve. I mean, shit, that's why I'm doing all this, right? Okay, all right. Let's 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 wrap it up here. My stomach is grumbling. All I had was some oatmeal this morning. All right, there we go. So not finish, not complete. Didn't finish this side of the face. Lips could probably use a little bit more like darkening of the, the upper lip. Probably should be more shadow on the underside of the chin. Not underside of the chin, but underside of the mouth. With that said, still an improvement. All right, I keep putting lines on here. I need to stop. In fact, even with this, I'm like, ugh, I'm gonna erase a little bit. Maybe that's the thing I need to do is whenever I'm doing a drawing and I realize things are going bad, just wipe it down and draw on top. That might be what I need to do is just really take advantage of the wipe down. All right. <laughs> Byron says, LOL. James says, looks good. And Byron says, it's not pandering. It's knowing your audience. You got to think positive. You know what? Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're keeping me on the, on the, keep me on the positive path. 
Okay. 93 RP1 says, I think I'll pull out my sketch pad and try something. Been using the computer art program and tablet today. Going back to pencil, pencil and sketchbook will be fun. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm constantly jumping back and forth between digital and traditional. And I always feel like my growth happens with the traditional, but then I take that and apply it to the digital and can do things that I was not able to do before. I can grow and expand. And it's such a, you know, digital art tools, Photoshop, Procreate, Clip Studio, Paint. They're all such powerful tools for picture making, you know, working color and value and being able to distort stuff and, and manipulate it um, and make rapid changes in iteration. But yeah, working on the fundamentals, I take those, what I learned and bring that back and it, it definitely makes a difference when I bring it back to the other uh, digital tools. And Amar said, um, you said white it down and I heard wipe it down. So I thought, I thought that would, uh, so I thought of the song. That's what the comment was from. Um, no, I, um, I I said wipe because that's what I was doing was actually, I mean, if you, if you watch the replay later, you'll see it. But I went through um, this drawing. I did the construction. And then to show, you know, wanting to have light construction lines as opposed to erasing it, I just went through and smeared it wiped it down like you know the wipe down method and then drew the finished construction drawing on top and then for this one i you know i went back and wiped down what was already a finished drawing and then redrew into it so all right guys we've been here for hours literally hours i have other shit to do today you guys have other shit to do today <laughs> Oh, we all have other shit to do today. But you know what? I I, I appreciate our time together. It is it's it's very very precious to me. And and again, I, I just want to say again to, to monumental comments. Thank you so much for the uh, the super chat. I'm just throwing that up again to give you another thank you and shout out. I appreciate it. Um, on that note, if you enjoy these live streams, I would like to get live streams that are about this long and a little bit longer <laughs> you can become a patreon subscriber uh head on over to patreon.com slash jeremy it's patreon.com slash g-e-r-i-m-i -I. um we do these things called art book study group which are uh two and a half three hour long sessions where we do deep dive some of the best art books around and try to suck out all the knowledge we can we've been doing a long running series on walt reed's the figure and if you join, you will get access to, you can get a, if you head over to Patreon, you can sign up for free, get a free seven day trial. You can go in, watch um, as many of those videos as you can cram in to seven days. Um, but there's a backlog, uh, a backlist of all of the videos of the previous art book study groups. And I'll notify you guys when we do the next ones. Um, we do those the first and third Monday of each month. And we also have a voice channel open on Discord. So as opposed to just typing in the chat, you can actually get on and talk like human beings. You can actually have a conversation. Um, and the Discord is a Patreon-exclusive Discord server. We share art, work in progress, encouragement, art tools, feedback, shop talk, and more. It's just allowing what we do right now to go and continue beyond th throughout the week. So it's a deeper experience and you get access to a, uh, an archive of my comic books digitally. So you can read them digitally online. So all that, patreon.com slash Jeremy. If you like a free digital sketchbook, work in progress, animated GIFs delivered right to your inbox, blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you like to purchase physical copies of my comic books. Or if you read digitally on Comixology or Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It's a standalone psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. You can pick up my most recent comic book series, Morningstar. It is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven retold as a Western. So it's an eight issue series. Volume one contains issues one through four. Volume two contains the conclusion, issues five through eight. Both volumes have extensive back matter. There's script excerpts, thumbnails, page layouts, 
photo reference, character designs. I basically show you how I put the whole comic book together. Um, and if you want to check out what's inside all of these books before picking them up, head on over to my YouTube channel, scroll down, and you'll see a playlist of book flip throughs. So you can actually flip through all the books, see what's inside them before you buy, and check it out. All right, guys. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. I appreciate you guys. Um, thank you for all the great comment comments and feedback and conversation. That's it for now. Go be creative.